In the last video, I walked you through the process of configuring Nginx to serve WordPress sites over HTTPS. However, if we want our sites to feel snappy, we need to do more. In this video, I'll guide you through the process of caching a WordPress-based site. Caching will increase throughput, which is basically the number of requests per second that your server can handle. It will also decrease response times, which means improved load times. So how bad is WordPress performance without caching? Let's find out. I'm going to show you how the site we have already set up will handle traffic without any caching at all. Now, it's difficult to simulate real web traffic. However, it is possible to send a large number of concurrent requests to a server and track the time of the response. This gives us a rough indication of the amount of traffic a server can handle, but it's also going to give you a measure of performance once we implement the optimizations. So the server we're running to recap is a one gigabyte digital ocean droplet. We set it up in the very first video of this series. I'm using loader.io to send an incremental amount of concurrent users to the server within a 60 second time period. The users scale starting with one concurrent user and increasing up to 50 concurrent users by the end of the test. All right, let's see how our one gigabyte droplet fares. This is about a $6 a month server. All right, let's hit run test. All right, we can see the test is progressing right now. You watch up here, you can see our response time gradually climbing. So the average response time is now about 138 milliseconds. All right, we've made it to the end of the test and you can see our response time right here has climbed up to 314 milliseconds. And if you track that as the clients are added, you can see the average response time goes up and up and up as our server scales with the number of concurrent users. That means that the more visitors on the site, the slower it will load. All right, it's time to optimize. Let's talk about object cache. An object cache stores database query results so that instead of running the query again the next time the results are needed, the results are served from the cache. This greatly improves the performance of WordPress as there is no longer a need to query the database for every piece of data that's required to return a response. Redis is the latest and greatest when it comes to object caching. However, popular alternatives include memcached and memcached. To install Redis, let's connect to our server, then type sudo apt install redis-server. Yes to continue. And now Redis is installed. Of course, we want to restart PHP here to make sure that everything is loading properly. sudo service php 7.4-fpm restart. So now Redis is running, but in order to use it with WordPress, we need to install a plugin. So let's head back over to Chrome and I'm going to load up our fresh WordPress website. Let's go ahead and get logged in here. Let's head over to plugins, add new, then let's search for Redis object cache. This first one right here by Til Cruz, uh, I'm probably saying that wrong. That's the one I recommend. Let's install and activate. Now that it's installed, let's go over to settings, Redis, and let's enable the object cache. Now this is also the same screen you can come back to if you need to flush the cache when needed. Now I'm not going to run the benchmarks again right now as the results won't have dramatically changed quite yet. We will be running them again a little bit later. Now, although object caching reduces the average amount of database queries, say the front page has 22 and you turn on object caching, it might go down to about two. Now that's gonna be theme and plugin dependent. Whatever you're running on your site will impact those numbers for sure. But the database server is still being hit. Establishing a MySQL connection on every page request is one of the biggest bottlenecks within WordPress. You can use a plugin like Query Monitor to check your average database query time. We found that when we turned on object caching, our query time was decreased from 2.1 milliseconds down to just 0.3 milliseconds. But in order to see a big leap in performance and a big decrease in server resource usage, we must avoid a MySQL connection and PHP connection altogether enter page caching. For many sites, content is rarely updated. Therefore, it's not efficient to load WordPress, query the database, and build the desired page on every single page request. Instead, we can serve a static HTML version of the requested page. Nginx allows you to automatically cache a static HTML version of a page using the fast CGI module. Once you've visited a page, any subsequent request to that page will receive the cached HTML version without ever hitting PHP or 
or MySQL, which means you will have a happy server. Getting set up requires just a few changes to your Nginx server block. This is a good time to point out if you'd find it easier to see the whole thing at once, you can download the Nginx config kit. Now that's gonna be the last article in the written version of this guide. I'll also be going over it in the last video of this series. Assuming you're still with me, let's go ahead and open up our virtual host file. I'm gonna go back to the written version of this guide and I'm gonna grab this command right here. I'll copy this, paste it into our text editor, and of course, update my domain name. Copy that, head back to our SSH connection and paste in the command. Once you're inside the nano editor, we're gonna bounce back over to the written version of the guide and there is a line right here that I need to copy. Of course, once again, I'm gonna paste this into my text editor so I can update both the domain name as well as the username. I'll do a search and replace here, command or control F, search for the domain name ashleyrich.com and replace that with your own domain name. Great, we're not done yet. We also have a username to update right here is an Ashley. I'm just gonna go ahead and type in my username. We'll copy this and head back over to our nano editor. And right before this first server block, I'm just gonna paste in that line. Now you'll notice that I'm storing my cache within my site's directory on the same level as the logs and public directories. Next up, we need to instruct Nginx not to cache certain pages. Let's go ahead and add a directive so that screens and pages for logged in users and admins are not cached. Back over to the written version of the guide, I'm gonna copy this section right here. Back over to the nano editor, this section should go before the first location block right here. I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit of space, paste it in. Next up, we need to find the PHP location block and add a few more directives. I'm gonna scroll down here, and sure enough, here is the PHP location block. I'm gonna go right towards the end of the block, head over to the written version of this guide. Here is the next chunk of code I need. I'll copy this, paste it into my text editor, update my URL, of course. Copy, back over to nano editor, and paste it in. Notice how the fast CGI cache directive matches the key zone set before the server block back at the top of the screen here. Back down in the PHP location block, I wanna point out that you can change the amount of time that the cache is valid for. Right now it's set to 60 minutes. So you can go ahead and update this to whatever you like. However, the default of 60 minutes is a good starting point for most people. If you do change this, you should also consider scrolling way back up to the beginning of this configuration file under the fast underscore cache underscore path line. At the very end, there's something that you'll see that says inactive. It also has a value of 60 minutes. Let me go ahead and scroll over to it. This inactive parameter specifies the length of time cache data is allowed to stay in cache without being accessed before it's removed. So you probably want to tweak this so that it matches how long your cache lives. All right, once you're happy, go ahead and hit Control X to save, return, and next we need to add some directives to our Nginx configuration file. Back over to the written version of the guide, here is the command to open up the Nginx config file. I'll copy that, paste it in, First up, we need to add directives that instruct the fast CGI module on how to generate key names. Let's go ahead and find the gzip settings. Scroll down, here they are. Now heading back over to the guide, we're gonna copy and paste this block right here and paste it in right below the gzip settings. Save your configuration and restart Nginx. Sudo service Nginx restart. Now let's visit our site and check out our headers. We should see some extra parameters that confirm that our cache is working. So with the page loaded, I'm gonna right click, go down to inspect. I'll choose network. Let's reload the page one time. I'm gonna go ahead and choose the location right here. And we see the headers right at the top. Now, if we scroll down a little bit, we'll see our cache right here. If it says hit, that means your page was cached. If it says miss, it means your page was not cached. You should try refreshing if you do get that message. You might also see bypass, which means the page is cached but not being served. This will be when you're logged in as an administrator or a logged in user. All right, the last step here is to install the Nginx cache plugin, also by Till Cruz. Back over in the WordPress admin area, we'll go to plugins, add new, search for Nginx cache. Here it is, let's install and activate. Now we can go over to tools, Nginx cache. Just a couple settings here for the Nginx cache plugin. First, we need to enter our cache zone path. This is gonna be the same directory that we set up inside of our zone file. It's gonna be the fast CGI underscore cache underscore path. Let me go back over to the nano editor and just grab this. Remember, it was the top line. For us, it's gonna be something like slash home, slash username, slash your domain name, slash cache. I'll copy that and paste it in. Next, I'm also going to check this box to automatically flush the cache when content changes. Hit save changes and my settings are changed. 
change. Now I can also manually purge the entire cache from this menu right here in the top menu bar. Now of course there's also a command to purge the entire cache if you've been locked out of your server. Let's say your site won't load because it's been caught in a redirect loop. You can go over to the written version of this guide, grab this command, and it just pasted it in through SSH. All right, next let's talk about WooCommerce. Now page caching is something that you're going to want to enable for the majority of front end pages out there, but there are times when it can cause issues, particularly when you're doing any sort of e-commerce. For example, in most cases, you don't want to cast the shopping cart or the checkout pages because they're generally unique for each visitor. You also wouldn't want visitors seeing the contents of another visitor's shopping carts. Trust me, I've seen this happen. It is bad news. Back over in the written version of this guide, you'll find this conditional right here that will add exclusions for the cart checkout and my account page created by WooCommerce. Now, if you're using a different plugin such as Easy Digital Downloads, BuddyPress, or CartFlows, you'll want to add exclusions dedicated to that plugin. You should definitely check out the documentation for those specific plugins to learn how to exclude their pages from caching. For now, I'm going to copy this and open up the configuration file for my site. I'm going to go to the server block and I'm going to head down right below the last conditional. I'll go ahead and insert the line right here and we'll save and exit. Next, let's restart Nginx. Of course, you're going to want to test this out before driving live traffic to it. So what you'll want to do is visit one of those pages with WooCommerce and check out those headers. You should see bypass inside of the headers inside of Google Chrome's inspector. So now it's the moment you've been waiting for. How much better is WordPress's performance with caching enabled? I'm actually going to modify the test a little bit here. We're going to go up from one client all the way to 750 clients. Last time we did just 50. All right, now that that's set, let's go ahead and run the test for a second time. Remember the first time our average response time was 314 milliseconds. You can watch this number right here to see how it changes. All right, we're all done. You can see the average response time was just 57 milliseconds, and we went from serving only 50 concurrent users to serving 750 concurrent users. So you can see that even though this is a small and affordable droplet, you can serve a lot of concurrent users when you're serving non-dynamic content. Performance optimization is a lot more difficult on highly dynamic sites where the content updates frequently. Things like WooCommerce or e-commerce in general, BB Press or BuddyPress, any sort of online community or forum, and online courses, things like LearnDash or Tutor LMS, where you might be offering quizzes. Those can't be cached. In these situations, it's required to disable page caching on the dynamic sections of the site. This means you'll go back into the Nginx server block and add additional rules to the skip cache section. Of course, this forces those requests to hit PHP and generate the page on the fly. Doing so will mean that you'll have to scale your hardware sooner and then your server costs will increase. At this point, you might be wondering why I chose server caching over installing a plugin such as WP Rocket or WP Super Cache. Well, first, not all plugins include object caching. And for those that do, you often need to install additional server like Redis, for example, just like we already did in this video in order to take advantage of that feature. Second, just flat out caching plugins don't perform as well as server based caching. So that concludes this video. In the next video, we'll dig into crons, emails, and automated backups.